Hey gang, um, thanks for joining me in this rather unconventional lecture. I am super excited for you guys that you only have to listen to me this week. You don't have to look at me while I'm talking. Um, today we're going to talk about patient satisfaction and service recovery. And then we're also going to get into filtration and collimation. So I'm going to have you guys listen to the lecture. And then Ashley has brought in some of your worksheets, so I'm gonna have you guys try to complete those. If you have any questions for me at all, make sure you write them down so that we can talk about them next week. And uh, hopefully this all makes sense to you since you're just listening to this and I'm not actually there. So when we talk about patient satisfaction, there's two big questions that we have people ask themselves. The first one is how important is it to you that your patient has a satisfying experience in radiology? And the second question is how much control do you feel you have over the factors that influence their satisfaction? And those are two pretty different things, but they do tie into each other. So for example, how important is it to you that your patients are all really happy while they're there and while they leave? Not just, you know, not grumpy or not complaining, but actually leaving feeling satisfied with the service that they had in your care. And also how much control do you feel you have over those factors? Obviously, your interaction with them can kind of make or break the whole exam, but what about how they get to you? You know, did they have an easy time parking or a difficult time parking? Did they find the reception desk okay? Was the receptionist um, nice to them or friendly with them? Did they just get bad news earlier in the day? Are they worried about what kind of news they're gonna get? There are a lot of factors that influence your patient satisfaction that you really don't have a whole lot of control over hospital-wide but your patient satisfaction with their experience while they're in your area, you have a lot of influence over that. Two important things then are the customer's initial experience and their final experience. If somebody comes to us always already grumpy or already upset, there are things you can do to turn their day around. So their initial experience with us when they first come to check in, that can set the tone for your whole exam. Uh, if the receptionist is really friendly and nice and helpful, it could turn a grumpy patient around. Um, likewise, if the receptionist does not have a good interaction with our customer or our patient, then that could already set the tone for your exam. And no matter how outgoing and friendly and helpful you are, the patient's already kind of angry. So it's really important that they have a really good initial experience, that that primary effect is a really good one. Um, also their final experience. Usually, however people are feeling when they leave, that's what they relay to other people. So if they show up grumpy and we kind of turn their experience around and they leave thinking we were quick, we were efficient, it was a lot easier than they expected, then they might go out and when people ask how their day was, they'll tell them, I had a really great experience at the hospital. However, if we have a bad final experience, if our patient is angry with our service, they leave and that's what gets logged into their long-term memory. So that's what they're gonna tell other people about their experience. Whether they had a really great day and one bad exam, it's gonna make the whole day seem like it was horrible. First impression, something that's important um, is establishing trust. So the patients really wanna know that they can trust you. They wanna know that they're not just a number to you, that they matter. It's not just a chest x-ray, it's not just an abdominal x-ray, but that's Holly Becker and she has this going on in her life and this is the exam that I need to do for her. They need to trust that you have their best interest in mind, not that you're just doing a complete abdomen because that's what the resident ordered, but that you're doing a complete abdomen because that's really what they need to have so that they can diagnose what's going on with this patient and help them. They want to know that you're actually listening to them, that you hear what they're saying. So if a patient has reservations about their exam or they have questions about why we're doing this or why we're doing that, patients want to know that when they're voicing those concerns to you, you're really hearing them. They want to know that you're competent and that you won't hurt them. So I know in our job, there are a lot of times where you have to move a patient around and it's not the most comfortable, but if they trust you and they know that you're doing your job and you can do their job well, They'll know that their discomfort isn't because you're hurting them, it's because of something that's going on with them and you're doing what you need to do to help them and that you're not going to lie or deceive them. A big part of communicating with our patients is our nonverbal communication. And the reason we talk specifically about nonverbal 
communication is that some providers are not aware of the nonverbal messages that they send. Um, I'm one of those people. I'm very expressive. I have no control over my facial movements. So if I'm irritated about something, it's all over my face, regardless of the words that are coming out of my mouth. And so it's really important when you are trying to establish trust with a patient, when they're trying to let them know that you are listening to them, that your nonverbal communication matches your verbal communication. So you have to be very aware of your facial expressions. That's something that I have to consciously work on. You know, if you smell something funky, you don't crinkle up your nose. If they say something that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, you're not rolling your eyes. Um, it's really important that you make eye contact with your patients. If you're kind of looking around the room, then it seems to them like you're not listening or um, maybe what you're telling them isn't entirely true because you can't look them in the eye. It's really important um, to be on the same plane as your patient. So if your patient is sitting down, you should be sitting down. And if your patient is standing, then you should be standing. You don't want to be standing and talking to a patient who's sitting. It feels very intrusive and overpowering. Um, be very careful of your gestures, you know, eye rolls, shrugging of the shoulders, kind of smiling and nodding, um, that sort of thing. So how do we decide how we're doing with patient satisfaction? Well, we have talked about this briefly at the beginning of class, um, but we have a contract with a corporation called Prescani, and they run our patient satisfaction surveys for us. So every patient, inpatient, outpatient, adult, pediatric, ER, receive a survey in the mail. We have them fill it out and send it back to us, and then we kind of run all of these numbers through the system, try to figure out how we're doing. Three of the questions on the survey that we like to pay special attention to are the overall satisfaction, the likelihood to recommend, and then also the sensitivity to the patient's needs. We use these markers as the indicators in our progress. So you can kind of see here, um, we started, I started this chart in 2008, and we kind of started marking our progress. So we implemented our GET initiative, our patient satisfaction initiative in between 2010 and 2011. It was kind of in the works for that year. So you can see how all of our numbers increased from 2010 to 2011, which is what we want to see. That's why we implement initiatives. Along with the actual numbers that we get for our patient satisfaction surveys, there's also a place where patients can make comments. They make uh, positive, negative, and neutral comments. Some of the positive comments I've written here, the radiology clinic was awesome, everyone was professional and friendly, you're always very kind and attentive. It's great to read these, and we read these and we like these, and it tells us that we are doing things correctly. But when we meet to talk about patient satisfaction, we actually tend to focus on the negative comments. And it's not to get anyone into trouble or anything like that, but it's just that those are the areas that we need to improve on. So we need to focus um, on keeping the good areas good, but we really need to focus on improving the bad areas. On our most recent survey, here are some negative patient comments. The assistants were not friendly, the doctor spoke on top of me, the tech wasn't friendly, and waited an hour before they came to get me. You'll kind of notice throughout these that there's a really big theme of communication. A lot of times the patient comments are simply something that could have been alleviated if we had just communicated with our patient. One of the quotes that we use uh, a lot when we talk about patient satisfaction is the um, Madame du Dufond, let us strive to improve ourselves for we cannot remain stationary. One either progresses or retrogrades. And that's how we feel about patient satisfaction. We set a lot of goals, and it's great when we meet our goals, but someone cannot remain stationary. We can't meet our goal and just float there. You either progress and get better, or you retrograde and you get worse. So it's important that even once we hit our benchmarks, we're still trying to do everything we can to improve our patient satisfaction. About the same time that radiology rolled out our initiative, the hospital rolled out a patient satisfaction initiative as well. Ours is called GET. Uh, the patient satisfaction acronym for the entire hospital is a nod at and thanks. Um, it stands for acknowledge and greet, name, occupation, duty, anything else, and thank you. So here's an example of something that a hospital employee would say to a patient that would be kind of broken down along the lines of the hospital acronym. 
Hi, my name is Sheila Smith. I am your volunteer and I'm here to deliver your flowers today. Is there anything else I can do for you? I have the time. Thank you. So if we look at this broken down, she introduced herself, hello, that's acknowledge and greet, gave her name and her occupation, Sheila Smith and I volunteer. What's my duty? Well, I'm here to deliver your flowers. Is there anything else I can do for you? And thanks. So it sounds probably pretty familiar and that's because our department has our own get, greet, explain, thank. Um, the hospital initiative is very similar. I think ours is probably a little easier to remember being that it's only three steps. So greet, a warm and sincere greeting. So you make eye contact, use your full name and you introduce yourself. Um, this is really important in communication because the patients encounter a lot of people on a given day. Some people are here for one exam, not usually. People usually come to the hospital because they're seen in clinic, they come to us for an exam. There's a whole number of things going on. One of the examples we like to use in that it is so important to greet yourself and give them your name is we had a complaint from a patient who was getting a lumbar puncture. So as we know, when you're getting a lumbar puncture, you're lying face down on the table. You have your pants pulled down, your butt's hanging out, you have just a towel and you can't see anything. You're laying face down. Um, we started out with the resident and the tech in the room. And once the resident thought they were in, they called the staff. The staff came into the room and didn't say anything to the patient. So here's a patient who's laying down exposed with a needle in their back and they hear the door open. They hear someone coming in. They hear their doctor talking to that person. They have no idea who that person is, why they're in the room, what their job is, and why they're looking at their butt. So super important in every situation that you uh, greet your patient, explain who you are. The second step is explain. So basically you need to explain the exam that you're doing, what we're doing, um, what's happening as you go along, what's gonna happen next, how long it will take, et cetera. An example of a reason why this is really important, I always think back to breast imaging. Uh, we have a lot of patients who get called back for extra views. They come back and they're really nervous about what's going on because the doctor has told them or their letter has told them or my chart has told them, you need extra views. We saw a density, we saw calcifications and they Google it. And Google is the worst thing in the world when it comes to a medical issue. And so now they're sure they have cancer they're nervously sitting there. It's really important to explain. Hi, my name is Holly. I'm here to do your exam. We're doing two extra pictures that are called magnification views. The reason we're doing this is because the radiologist saw some micro calcifications in your breast that are very small and we need to magnify them. Once they're magnified, the doctors can see more of their characteristics and explain to you what they think the micro calcifications mean. That can put a patient really, really at ease as opposed to just saying, my name's Holly and I'm taking your extra pictures. Thank you. Patients like to be thanked. Everyone in the world likes to be thanked. People don't like to do stuff and have somebody just walk off and not say anything and not, not acknowledge what you've done for them. We need patients. I would not have a job if we didn't have patients because you would not need a job and I would not need to teach you how to do that job. So always just say thank you. Um, if you're explaining to a patient why they're waiting so long, thank you for your patience. Um, if you know your patient waited a long time and then you do their exam, thank you for waiting. Uh, if the family members helped or if the patient had a lot to do, thank you for your help in getting this done. Thank you for coming to the hospital. Like we talked about before, it's really important that they leave with a good last impression. So by you saying thank you for choosing us, thank you for your help, thank you, have a nice day, is there anything I can help you find? Do you have more appointments? It really makes them feel like you care and it gives them that great last impression that they're gonna carry with them out the door. That kind of leads me into service recovery. Um, we always want our patients to have a good experience. We need a good first impression. We need a good last impression. Um, what happens when that doesn't work? What happens when a patient comes to you already upset? Or what happens when you have to make a patient do something uncomfortable for their exam and they're really not happy with it. What happens when something goes wrong is service recovery. It's what happens after the oops that has made our angry customer. Um, the goal is to kind of preserve that relationship. So we want that patient to come back to us. We want them to continue to work with us. So if something has happened, we need to fix it. And the hospital came up with service recovery to kind of help us give the resources to all of the employees to do this. It's important 
um, because only 5 to 10 percent of dissatisfied people will actually complain. So that seems good initially, right, because nobody likes to listen to a lot of complaining. But what's bad about that is instead of complaining and hoping something will change, customers will just go somewhere else. So if a patient has a really bad experience at our hospital and nobody ever tries to make it better, they'll just go to Mercy. They won't actually come to us and say, this happened to me, I want to know why it happened to me, I'm angry, and give us the opportunity to fix it. So that means everyone in the hospital is responsible for service recovery. It's important, 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 and when we're teaching this to the staff at their new staff orientation, we always say, it might not be your fault, but it is your problem. If your patient is unhappy, because of something that happened before they even got to you, doesn't matter. It's not your fault, it happened beforehand, but it is your problem, because they're unhappy and they're with you. So we make sure that every staff member is um, taught the heart model, which is what kind of explains the service recovery steps for the hospital. The heart model is hear, empathize, apologize, resolve, and think. So the first step here, you need to ask the patient what's going on. Is there something that I can do? Empathize with them. I understand how that can be so frustrating. Apologize. I'm so sorry this is happening to you. This is what I want to do about it. Thank you so much for letting me help you. Super easy steps. I think it's common sense, you know, for most people, but it's something that just needs a refresher every once in a while to remember. Um, this might look familiar to you guys. It's our service recovery toolkit. It's a white binder that has this cover and they're kept in all of the areas of the hospital. They are not just in our department and it contains all of our um, service recovery tools. So here are an example of our five service recovery tools. Up in this corner, we have the probably most popular one, which is the three hour prepaid parking. Um, Parking is not popular here at the hospital. You have to pay for it. Uh, there's not a lot of it, and it's difficult to get to, especially because it seems like we are always under construction. So this is something that goes a long way with people. And a lot of times, if I have a patient who's upset because we're running behind schedule or something happened and they've had to wait a long time, I like to give them a three hour parking and say, you know what, I know that one of the most frustrating things about this hospital is finding a parking spot and then having to pay for it. And it's my fault that you're here longer than you need to be. So here's three hours worth of parking. I hope that helps alleviate the cost of the extra time that we kept you here. Um, there are a couple other kind of monetary things. One in the upper right hand corner here is the food and nutrition gift card. It's worth $5. They can take it to any one of our locations and use it. So sometimes if I have a patient who's waiting a long time for an exam and they're allowed to eat, then I'll give it to them and say, you know what, I'm so sorry. It's going to be another 45 minutes. Do you want to go get a cup of coffee and come back? Or if you had a patient that you kept way longer in the morning, sometimes I like to give them one and say, hey, you know, do you want to swing down through the, the gift shop and grab something to eat. I know it's been a long time since you had something. You know, I'm so sorry about taking up most of your morning. There's also a $10 gift card for the Wild Rose gift shop. That's pretty cool. You know, um, a lot of our patients can't really probably eat, you know, uh, like in Floro if they're waiting for a long time. And a lot of patients, when they're done, they don't want to go to the gift or to the cafeteria. They want to leave. But if you give them a $10 gift card to the gift shop, there's actually a lot of cool stuff down there, jewelry and Hawkeye gear um, and the bookstore, the books. And so they might want to swing by and just get themselves something. Uh, for inpatients, if we have a problem with an unhappy inpatient, this one down in the lower right hand corner is cool. You can call the gift shop and have a floral delivery completed. So it's a lot easier to give it to somebody who's an inpatient because you can send it back. I know it's been used before, if a patient comes down for something in fluoro and they have to wait a long time in holding, uh, the techs will actually call and have the floral delivery sent up to their room. And then by the time they get back up to their room, it's already up there, thanking them for their time and sorry we made you wait. The pale white one in the background is just um, University of Iowa Stationery. It's probably, honestly, the least popular, but sometimes uh, patients feel like a number here. It's a big hospital and they feel like we don't really know anything about them. 
So sometimes if I have a patient who, um, you know, even if I've given them a parking pass or a gift card, especially in Mamo, I've written down their name and sent them just a note saying, hey, thank you again for coming to us for a mammogram, and I'm so sorry that you had to wait that extra half hour. I hope the parking pass was helpful, and um, I look forward to seeing you for your next mammogram. So you can fill out like a personalized note and send it to them. All of the tool kits, are, kits in our areas are kept at the reception desks. Um, General, MSK, CT and IR has one, PET, NUCMED, MAMO, MRI, all at the desks. Um, in fluoro and CT and ultrasound, they're kept in the work area, at the kind of command area. Um, they're also in all the administration offices and inpatient and outpatient units. So like I said before, um, patient satisfaction isn't always your fault, but it is your problem. So there have been times when I've been out on a portable and I've encountered a really unhappy family member or a really unhappy patient and I've gone to that inpatient unit and said, can I have your service recovery binder? And I've tried to rectify it, like, here's a food card. I'm sorry that you had that experience. You know, if you want to kind of get out and go get a coffee or a soda, um, you know, please do so. I'm really sorry. So it's probably not my fault. You know, they're on this inpatient unit and I've, this is the first I've seen of them, but they're unhappy. And so you don't have to come all the way to radiology to get service recovery materials and you don't need um, to be in your own area with an unhappy patient. Anytime you encounter somebody by an outpatient clinic, an inpatient unit, you can go to their desk and ask for their binder and then um, try and make the patient happy. So the Iowa experience, patient satisfaction. Get your patients, use your heart, every patient, every time. For your test, your final coming up in May, um, I would suggest that you know the acronym GET as well as the acronym HEART and ANADA and THANKS. Um, for service recovery GET, I want you guys to submit um, no fewer than 250 words telling me how you use GET when you're in clinic and describe a situation where you had to use service recovery or you feel like service recovery should have been used with a patient that you might not have, that might not have been so happy and what tool you would have used out of the service recovery kit. All right, I know that was a lot. Okay, we're gonna power through filtration now. So, uh, when we talk about filtration, machines come equipped with a specific amount of filtration, which is called inherent. On uh, our x-ray tubes, it is 0.5 millimeter aluminum equivalent, which is important for you to know. It's also contained in a glass or metal envelope, um, which is important for you to know. It sits in an oil bath and it has a glass window in the housing. So here's an example. Um, you can see here that I have circled where the extra filtration would be. And then here on the right hand side, this is all encased in a tube, okay? So here's the anode and it's in the glass envelope and you hit the anode and then it's traveling through the tube. And this is where our collimator is, you know, and down here's our patient. So here is the filtration. It's added right after the x-ray is produced at the anode. So the um, x-ray beam has to pass through the added filtration and then it comes down through the collimator and down to our patient. It is important to know what your filtration is because filtration's whole deal is to remove the low energy photons, which is really important to patient dose. So when we produce an x-ray, we have a bunch of different beam energy. So the really high energy beams are gonna pass right through our patient and they are either going to create our image or they are going to um, bounce off the plate and become scattered, okay? And then we have kind of mid-level x-rays and those are gonna be a combination. Some of them are gonna bounce off the patient and become scattered, some will become image, some will be absorbed. The low dose, the low energy photons, those are the ones that we wanna remove with filtration. They don't have enough power really to even become scattered. They don't have enough power to pass through the patient. They're just gonna be absorbed. So if we did not remove the low energy photons, then our patient skin dose can increase by as much as 90%. Um, filtration beam testing needs to be done on acceptance annually and when service is performed and there is no variation uh, percentage. It should not vary from its original value. So here's what I just said. We have our low energy and our high energy x-rays. So the high energy 
is going to come through, it's going to pass through the filter, it's going to hit our patient, it's going to go through and it's going to create an image. These low energy x-rays, these ones here, they get absorbed by the filter, which stops them from being absorbed by our patient. And that's what we want. We want lower patient dose. So how does the filtration even change? Um, there's something called filament evaporation. So the filament is what heats up to give us our electrons, which are going to turn into our x-ray. The filament drips when it gets heated up, just kind of like metal that's been heated up. And then it drips down and kind of creates this layer of tungsten that's on the inside of the x-ray tube. So because it drips when it's heat up, when it heat, heats up, sorry, and um, kind of spreads itself out on the inside of the x-ray tube, it really makes it difficult to measure the exact amount of inherent filtration. So instead, we measure what's called the half value layer. The half value layer is the amount of filtration required to reduce our exposure rate to one half of its initial value. So instead of measuring the filtration, we're gonna measure the beam quality. Um, it doesn't matter exactly the amount of filtration when we're talking about half value. What matters is that the beam quality changes from exposure to patient. It's pretty easy to calculate. Um, it's not very invasive and it's dependent on three things which are important for you to know. The KVP, the beam filtration, and the type of generator you're using. So the way that we uh, can test this is we set a dosimeter on top of the tabletop. So you can see here he has a dosimeter and um, this is underneath his x-ray beam. Okay, and this is gonna be the computer, like the digital readout of the dosimeter. So we put an apron down to prevent backscatter, and then we put the digital dosimeter 60 to 80 centimeters below the tube, and then collimate to an area just slightly larger than that dosimeter. You expose at 80 kV with 50 mass, and then you record your reading. Clear it all out, and then you'll add a plate that looks similar to this plate here. It's magnetic, so it hooks to the bottom of the x-ray tube over your collimator. It's clear, even though it has a millimeter of aluminum in it. And then you're going to expose again, 80 kV, 50 mass. Record that reading, clear it. And then you're going to repeat this until you have six to eight millimeters of thickness. Okay, so you're going to expose six to eight times because each time you're adding a one millimeter aluminum plate. After that's done, you will plot all of the values on a log graph paper, which I have here for you to do. Um, you put your readings from your dosimeter on the y-axis and your aluminum plate thickness on the x-axis. So it'll go from zero millimeter plates to six to eight millimeter plates. And then you connect all of those dots. When you look at your readings, you find the maximum reading, cut it in half, and then you draw a line from this number to the curve and then down to the x-axis. And this is your half value layer and it should be greater than 2.3 millimeters. Okay, so I know that was a whole lot of information and I'm gonna go through it with you step by step in the next couple of slides. But on this slide, I wanna make sure that you guys pay attention to this number here. Your half value layer should be greater than 2.3 millimeter and that's important for you to remember. So here is our semi-log graph paper, right? So we have our x-ray intensity, that's our reading from our dosimeter, and our absorber thickness. So we have zero millimeters of aluminum, one plate, two plate, up to six plates. Here is our chart, okay? So all are 80 kV, they're all 50 mass, and our absorber thickness goes from zero, no plates, to six plates. And then this was the reading that we got off of our digital dosimeter, okay? So on our graph paper, we're gonna start logging these. So let's say we're at zero millimeter thickness and our intensity was 0.5. So you would put a point at zero millimeter thickness, 0.5 intensity, okay? Then we're gonna go to one millimeter. We have one aluminum plate on and it read out at 1.0. So we are gonna put another dot on 1.0. Okay, so you're going to continue to plot all of them up to your six millimeters and then you're going to connect them with a line so you have a really nice curved graph here. 
Now you need to find your maximum intensity. Okay, so we look at our readings and we see that our maximum intensity was eight millirem, and half of that is four. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a line from the y-axis to four millirem. Okay, so here's our line. So we have four millirem, that's our half of our max intensity. And we are gonna start there and we're gonna draw a line out to our curve. And when we get to our curve, we need to put a point there, all right? Then we're gonna draw a line from that point down to our axis, down to the x-axis, and that tells us our half value layer, okay? So from this point, we draw down, we're at about a 4.5, okay, that's where that meets. So for our example here, our half value is 4.5 millimeter, all right. So that's greater than 2.3, um, and I'm going to show you guys where those numbers come from. In your book, which um, in the section you should have read for this class, there is a filtration beam quality chart. Um, since we exposed at 80 kV, we're going to use that kVp when we look at our chart, okay? So we're not a dental system. We don't care about that line. We are an x-ray system. If we exposed at 80, our half value layer has to be a minimum of 2.3. It needs to be greater than or equal to 2.3. When we calculated ours, it was a 4.5. So our filtration is way acceptable, right? We're blowing 2.3 out of the water. Um, it is important for you guys to know this chart, okay? Um, I don't expect you to know the whole thing. You can completely ignore the dental systems, but it is important for you to know 70, oops, sorry, 70, 80, 90, and 100. You need to know the minimum half value layers for 70, 80, 90, and 100 kVp. All right. If you can't, for some reason, calculate your half value layer, a different test can be performed. Um, it does not replace calculating half value, half value layer, but it will tell you if you have adequate filtration present. And it uses a digital dosimeter and a 2.3 millimeter, oops, that should say thick, <laughs> sorry, not thick, aluminum plate. So you put the dosimeter on tabletop on a lead apron, just like we did for the previous. You make an exposure using these factors, 40 inch SID, 80 kVp, 50 mass, record your readings, um, and expose that same technique, but you put a 2.3 millimeter aluminum plate where we were adding the plates before, it magnets onto the, co the um, collimator, and then you just expose again, same factors, and record that reading, and then you plug it into this formula. So if you have adequate filtration, your answer after you plug it in should fall between 0.5 and 0.75. Less than is inadequate and um, greater than is excessive. This is important to know. Also excessive filtration is acceptable, um, but you don't want a crazy amount of filtration, excessive filtration, because that's telling you that when your filament is dripping, like we talked about before, it's creating these deposits on the x-ray tube window, and eventually it can crack your window, or it can cause you to underexpose, because if it builds up a lot there, um, it's like an extra filter, and so you're going to start underexposing your films. So excessive filtration is okay, but if it gets too excessive, uh, the, rate, the engineers and the physicists need to take a look at it to see if you're actually damaging your tube. So um, what we talked about with the formula, if you exposed first without the plate, 80 at 50, and then you added your plate and exposed it, here are your readings, you would just divide 2.5 by 3.7, and that gives you 0.67. So that falls in our range, that's acceptable. All right, that's all I have for filtration. So I don't know if you guys want to pause me because you're tired of listening or I need to get up and stretch. We're going to talk about focal spot size. Um, and then you'll be done with me, I promise. So focal spot. You guys have already talked about this in digital imaging. Um, I think it's the part of the anode that we bombard with the electrons, okay? 
So it's where they lose their kinetic energy and become x-rays. There are two perspectives. We talk about the actual and the effective. And I know you guys love it when we talk about that in our general objectives. Um, the actual focal spot. So that's actually the part on the anode where the electrons are hitting when they're being bombarded. The effective focal spot is what is projected down onto your patient. So when you're adjusting your collimator and you're um, choosing your large or small, you're choosing your effective focal spot. The line focus principle tells us that our effective focal spot is dependent on our anode angle. If you have a smaller angle, you're gonna get a smaller focal spot. So for example, here we have our target angle. Okay, so here's our anode sitting here and then it's being bombarded with electrons. So if you draw, this is gonna hit up here and come straight down, and this is gonna come up here and come straight down. So here is our actual focal spot. That's what is shooting the electrons, right? And then here's our effective. So you can see it's much smaller when it's projected down onto the table. This is a pretty severe angle. You can see here that the angle is really small. So our recorded detail is affected by our focal spot size and it is inversely related. So if you have a really small focal spot, you have a whole lot of recorded detail, okay? So small focal spot, big recorded detail. If you have a big focal spot, like we would use on like an abdomen, um, you're not gonna get quite the recorded detail. Big focal spot, small recorded detail. It's really important that it remains constant over time. Uh, the focal spot size gets worn out, kind of like anything else with our tube. It increases with age and use, and it increases, um, it's harder on our focal spot the more mass you use. So if you have a lot of bariatric patients and you're maxing your tube out a lot, your focal spot size is going to change faster than a place that's not using such a high mass. Um, that's basically the blooming effect, right? So it's telling us that a higher MA, there's more blooming effect. It's affecting our focal spot and making it bigger. At the lower KVs, the lower masses, there's less blooming effect. There are three ways that you can test your focal spot size. The pinhole camera, the focal spot test tool, and using resolution charts. Um, just about like everything else, we test it on acceptance, we test it annually, and then any time that we work on our machine. The pinhole camera is basically just a plate of alloy that has a tiny hole cut in it. So if you're testing a focal spot size less than one millimeter, you use a plate that has a 0 0.03 millimeter hole. Okay, and then same, one to 2.5 is a 0 0.075 hole. And then the large focal spot, anything greater than 2.5 uses a one millimeter hole. You put the pinhole camera on a stand over your image detector and then um, you use an SID that is dependent on the needed enlargement factor. And I'll explain that, but if you are using a focal spot, a small focal spot, less than 2.5, your enlargement factor is two, which means that the pinhole camera should be 60 centimeters to the plate and the tube to pinhole camera should be 30. And then um, if you're using one greater than 2.5 millimeter, your effective, or I'm sorry, your enlargement factor is one, okay? And then you would use these differences. So let's take a look here. We have our focal spot, right? That's inside our tube. This is our pinhole camera. It's just an alloy plate with a hole in it. And then this is our image on our film. So depending on the size you're testing is where these would come into place. If we're testing something larger than 2.5 millimeters, then this distance should be 40, and then our, um, this distance should be 40. Okay, so you just adjust that using the stand. So you expose 75 kVp at 50 mass, and your reading at your plate should be 0.8 to 1.2. So we would measure that using a densitometer, like you guys were using to measure the step wedge. Um, you measure the pinhole area with a ruler or calipers, divide by your enlargement factor, and that gives you your focal spot. So here's an example. Um, it tells you what the focal spot size is, okay? So all three of these 
are less than 2.5 centimeters, so they all have the same enlargement factor. This is greater than 2.5, so it has its own enlargement factor. Um, and then these are the readings that you guys got, okay? So here is the measured focal spot. So let's say we're measuring a focal spot size of 0.6 millimeters, okay? Divide your measurement by the enlargement factor. So our focal spot measurement was 0.9. You divide by the enlargement factor of 2, which gives you a focal spot size of 0.45. So even though we thought we were using 0.6 millimeters, our actual focal spot size was 0.45. All right, so the next way we can test is a focal spot test tool. We just take a picture of the tool and then compare that image with the chart that the manufacturer of the tool sent to us. So here's what a focal spot test tool looks like, okay? Um, I think I sent one with Ashley, so you can take a look at it if you want to. You set it on the table, and it, it images this chart that you see here. Set it anode end, cathode end. It has 12 bar pattern groups. They're all different sizes. It's a 6-inch pl plexiglass uh, cylinder. And then there are also two holes that are 6 centimeters apart, the top and the bottom, to check the magnification. So for a large focal spot, you would place the focal spot test tool directly on the cassette or the table. If you're doing the false small focal spot size, then you need to use a spacer. And it just ha you have to be able to measure your spacer. So here we used um, a cushion because you can just measure and see how tall it is. Um, this is the equation down here that you have to use when you're talking about a small focal spot and using a spacer. We used a cushion, I used a cardboard box. So you will get an image that looks exactly like the top of the focal spot test tool. And then you're gonna use a magnifying glass to count the line pairs. And you want to see what is the smallest line pair group that you can see without all of the lines being blurred together. Here is a table, um, table 7-2, that can be found in PAP that accompanies the focal spot test tool. So if you take a look at your image and you say, I think that uh, pairing group 10 is the smallest group that I can be seen without the lines blurring together, I would look at group 10. Um, the line pair per millimeter is 4, and that tells me that my focal spot size was 0.9 millimeter. So here's the chart that can be found in the book. Here's the homework. Smallest group resolve 10, line pair per millimeter 4, dimensions of the focal spot size 0.9. Here is table 7-3. This is an important table for you guys to know for your exam. The focal spot size variation is determined by NEMA, which stands for National Electronics Manufacturers Association. If you are looking at a focal spot size smaller than 0.8, the amount of variation allowed is 50%. So if we thought we were exposing at 0.6 millimeter, 50% of that is 0.3, which means that our focal spot size range is 0 0.3, 0 0.6 minus 0 0.3, to 0 0.9, 0 0.6 plus 0 0.3. So our um, our dimension of 0.9 is just barely acceptable. Another way you can look at the focal spot size is a resolution chart. So a resolution chart is very similar to the focal spot test tool. Instead of line pair per millimeter, it is um, a star pattern, star and slit pattern. And um, it just tells you your line pair per millimeter and those correspond to your focal spot size. So you image on uh, detector that's tabletop and you record the image diameter which is represented with DI and then you compare it to the actual diameter of the pattern and that will give you your magnification factor. Okay so we're going to take a look at the pattern itself all right you're going to expose that and it's going to give you an image. So for example if this was our image we would measure the diameter and write that down in a chart. And then we would need to measure the diameter of the actual pattern that we exposed. So you would also write that down. 
and you'll use that to calculate your magnification factor. So once you calculate that, you measure the diameter of the blur zone, and it'll help you calculate the focal spot size using this formula. Now we're using the spoke angle of the star pattern, the diameter of the blur zone, and your magnification factor. Okay, now you guys will never have to calculate the spoke angle, you just need to know this formula and how to plug numbers into it, okay? So here's the blur zone. The blur zone is the part of the pattern where we can't tell the individual lines apart anymore. It just becomes kind of one big shade of gray. So if this is your homework, we're gonna take a look at it, okay? So let's say the actual diameter of the pattern is one, and we measure our image diameter, and it's three. We would um, calculate our magnification factor first. So three divided by one is three. Okay, so we're going to plug that into our chart. And then we're going to use uh, this formula here to calculate our focal spot size. So we know that this symbol stands for spoke angle, and then we have the diameter of our blur zone and our magnification factor. So we found our magnification factor. Our spoke angle is 0.25, the blur zone diameter is 2.0, and our magnification factor is 3. So we would plug everything in and find that our focal spot size was 0.25. We know again that our set focal spot was 0.8, which is allows 50% blooming. So our range is going to be 0.4 to 1.2, and our focal spot was 0.25, which is too small. That is not acceptable. Okay. That's all we have for today. I know that was a lot of information. I know they always are, and I know it's a little more difficult when I'm not there to ask questions. So the assignments that you're coming away with from this class are your GET submission about patient satisfaction and service recovery. Um, you have your filtration assignments where you'll need to graph and then calculate the digital dosimeter. And then there are three focal spot size assignments, okay? Now I've copied these all off and sent them with Ashley so you guys can sit in class and kind of um, help each other through. If you have any questions or something doesn't make sense, please, please, please write it down or email it to me and I will um, sit down with you and explain it as best I can. Um, and hopefully this all made sense. I know it's hard when I'm just talking at you, but good luck and please let me know if you need help with anything. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks.